let's begin. Uh, since maybe none of you, uh, not all of you were here yesterday when I gave my other talk, I will introduce myself again. So I am Etienne Dalcol. I'm a software engineering student from Brazil. I'm currently living in France where I'm finishing my integrated masters, so I'm going to be free very soon. I'm also the lead developer of Sailor, which is an MVC web framework in Lua. And I'm trying to organize something called Lua Ladies, which is an initi initiative to bring more women to programming through Lua. And last summer, I was in a student in Google Summer of Code. And I spent it um, working with um, the Lab Lua organization, which is the research laboratory for programming languages and the Lua language in the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio. OK, so the topics I'll cover in the talk are what is Lua, why using it, some key, concept, some key concepts, and then I'll share some cool stuff and resources in case you want to know more and go further later. OK, um, let's start. So Lua is not an acronym. It is a noun. So only the L is capital and means moon in Portuguese. And what is that? So it is a dynamic script, scripting language. So it is in the same family as languages like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, and has some very interesting aspects. So uh, it is multi-paradigm. So you can do procedural programming, object-oriented programming, functional programming. Uh, it has garbage collection, um, coroutines. So, um, Lua itself does not do real multi-threading as in uh, shared memory with preemption. Um, one of the main Lua architects says he doesn't really believe in it because nobody can write correct code when A equals A plus 1 is non-deterministic. So Lua solved this by having coroutines passing messages around. And you can have. Uh, multi-threading if you're embedding Lua into another language that does multi-threading and then you have two uh, Lua states on the coroutines. Um, Lua has first class functions so you can pass functions around like they are any other value. Uh, lexical scoping so you can do closures. Uh, and one very powerful thing is proper tail calls. So a tail call is when you have a function, and the last thing it does is calling a function. That is the last thing we'll do. After that, there is nothing. So Lua implements that as some kind of go-to dressed as a function call. So what you see is a function call, but uh, you can do infinite recursion with tail calls, and it will never explode the stack. Lua also is MIT licensed, which is one of the most permissive free software license I know. I believe you can fork it and call it potato if you want, but I'm not sure. And why using Lua? So Lua is very powerful. Um, the whole size of Lua with standard library, CPI, everything, and documentation included is 276 kilobytes. And the language itself is written in about 20,000 lines of standard C89. So you can run it on anything that runs standard C89 and has this space and some memory. So it will run on washing machines, very tiny microcontrollers, two powerful computers, games, and web developments. So it's very, very widely used. But while being so small, it provides lots of mechanisms um, as a high-level uh, programming language. It does, uh, it does not implement all of these mechanisms in the language itself, but it offers everything that you need to do the things you want. So for example, we first class functions, lexical scoping and meta tables. I'll get into more details about this one later. You can do object orientation. Lua also has a native C API, 
which is very interesting because it is a two-way street. So you can embed the whole Lua language into a C program and use Lua as a library, or you can use Lua and from Lua you'll call um, another program um, something in C. Uh, Lua has also been integrated to pretty much every language. I'm not sure why Pro, but anyway, lots of languages um, uh, have a communication in Lua, and because this C, uh, na native API is so great and there are so many integrations around, um, this leads to one thing that Lua is best at, which is being used as a Glow language. So lots of people, when they have models written and different things, and it's a hell to make that communicate with each other, they use Lua to make this communication. And it's very easy, and it works, and it's amazing. Going on, Lua is also very, very simple. So, oops, sorry. Uh, it's also very simple. So the, the fact that it is so small, of course, that it reflects on the simplicity of the language. So you can have it all on your head, and this is wonderful. So just so you have an idea, this is the whole standard library of Lua. You're not supposed to be able to read. That's OK. I just wanted to show you that it fits in one slide, This, the whole thing. Just for comparison, in PHP, just functions that begin with A, we have 391. OK, I know it's probably not fair to compare with PHP, but you got the idea. So since Lua itself is so simple, it tends to encourage you to solve problems simply. So this quote was made by Hagner Svensson, uh, which is a lead developer at King. And this quote was made during the last uh, Lua workshop, which was held at King's headquarters. So King is the company that develops Candy Crush. They were recently bought by Activision for something like $6 billion. So I think it's worth paying attention. And, um, and I really agree with that. Um, sometimes when I'm programming in other programming languages, I think, why am I doing like all of this to solve this tiny thing? And this almost never happens when I'm programming in Lua. This is something I particularly like. And Lua is also very fast. And by fast, I mean really, really fast. So um, this is uh, the average of um, various speed tests on different algorithms, such as pi digits, um, binary trees. And uh, as you can see, Lua performs better than other popular languages of the same family. And Lua also has a just-in-time implement implementation that is ultra fast. This little thing over here is the closest thing you'll ever find to see while still being a dynamic scripting language. So this is worth taking a look. Oops. Um, I didn't know all of those things when I started learning Lua, though. So I had other reasons. I'll call them better reasons, of course. So one of those things is that it looks cool. You can make games with it. So Lua is a very popular choice for game scripting. It is the top one programming language uh, for this purpose. So it's used from indie games to very, very popular names. So, uh, well, everyone knows World of Warcraft, I believe. Um, this used to be my favorite game ever. Um, Angry Birds uses Lua, the same uses Lua. And this was the first game ever to use Lua in 1997. Um, I'm trying to remember the publisher. I think it was LucasArts. I'm not sure. Yeah. And yeah, so th this was a, a turning point for the use of Lua as a game scripting language. Another reason is that it's made in my home country, Brazil, and in my university, to be more precise. I was actually very shocked. I didn't know that. So one day I was in university talking to some friends, and we were talking about Lua, and then somebody interrupted me, like, with a strange face, saying, you know it's made here, right? And I was like, 
what do you mean here? It's like, here, here. You're going to have classes with the main architect in about the third year. I was like, oh, OK. So I kind of took it as a matter of, of honor to learn it before I graduated. So it is actually not taught there <laughs> for some weird reason. So I, I, I wanted to learn it by myself. So um, another thing that is really interesting is that it, is, it was created in 1993. And up until today, it is the only language that comes from a country in development to reach this degree of popularity. I'd say that maybe apart from Ruby that comes from Japan, the only one that does not come from North America or Europe at all. Another point is, this is my favorite one actually, is that it is very easy to learn. So Lua was conceived from day one with some very specific goals. So it was initially uh, built for to, to control very bulky softwares for an oil state company in Brazil. And uh, one of these goals was to make it uh, very usable by non-professional programmers. So they needed to have civil engineers and geologists to be able to do things in the software. So Lua is conceived from from the ground to be readable and, and easy to understand and intuitive and non-ambiguous and it does a marvelous job at that. Okay, so what's different? I decided not to put these things in boxes of what is good, what is bad, because lots of these things could be subjective. So I just put different and I'll make some comments on that. One of the first complaints about Lua is that the index starts as one instead of zero. But um, I don't really believe this is a bad thing. I'm neutral about it. I think, I think this is just a matter of taste. Because maybe it is not very popular nowadays, but many languages used to have uh, one base uh, indexes. And Lua specifically inherited this form for a trend, for example. But there used to be many more languages that did that. And um, also, it is more human-like, if you think about it. So this is the founder of Stack Overflow. So he says, there are two hard things in computer science, caching validation, naming things, and off by one errors. <laughs> so maybe the index one is not really a bad thing. <laughs> nah. Oh, that depends where you come from. Um, this is one thing that bothers me sometimes. So um, there's a friend of mine who said, every time I want to use continue and I don't have it, I'm going to make it tweet automatically. But, um, but you can do without it, honestly. Uh, there are some syntax things that are just a little different. So the non-equality operator is tilde equal, which is OK, because uh, this is negation and first order logic, so it makes sense. Uh, no list nil, comments are to hyphens. This, uh, you can see that in other languages, such as Ada and Haskell. Um, this is something that may only nil and false are equivalent to false. This is something that may look weird from people that come from C, but this is something um, that exists in Python too, and I absolutely love that because I believe zero is a value like any other value. It is not, no, it is a value that is zero. So I like that. Functions can genuinely return multiple values, and by that I mean not like Python. So Python does, it's Python says it returns multiple values, but in fact what it does is that it packs everything into a value, returns it, and then unpacks it. So Lua does not do that. Lua actually returns multiple values without overhead. Variables are global by default. Um, OK, this is like JavaScript. In that you put var keyword, and Lua, you put the local keyword. 
Pattern matching is not regular expression. So Lua offers pattern matching for dealing with strings, but there are some tiny things from uh, regular expression that are not there. The reason for that is that because implementing this tiny thing would be bigger than the whole implementation of Lua, so they decided to leave it out. I never needed it in a way, but if, in case you really need um, all, everything from regular expression, there are external libraries that do that. Um, the concatenation operator is two dots. Um, I like that as well. It's, it is different. I haven't seen it in other languages yet. Um, but this avoids problems like the ones you have in JavaScript because the concatenation operator is plus and addition is plus. So when you're dealing with things with different types, you never know what, J what JavaScript is trying to do with that. So here you'll be sure of what's happening. There are some quick idioms. They're interesting. So, like I said, Lua returns multiple values. It also does multiple assignments. So you can do a variable swap in one line without uh, creating a, a temporary value. Lua has no ternary operator, which at first made me sad. But then I found out there were Booleans and that they can do pretty much the same thing. It is not exactly the same thing, though, because if this evaluates to true and this uh, is not a string, it's something that evaluates to false, it would jump to this part here, which is something that the ternary operator would not do. But mostly, this can do the job. Uh, and this is something that you see. Uh, but so because um, access to local variables is faster than the access to global uh, variables, uh, caching uh, global, global functions into a local function is something that you see happening very often if you read uh, somebody else's code in Lua. So if, in case you try to learn uh, uh, lurking each other's code, if you see that, this is why. OK, so I decided to bring you some uh, use cases of using Lua. And uh, I had a, a small problem naming uh, these two first things because they're both embedded. But here it's Lua on embedded systems, and here it's Lua on embedded, Lua being embedded on, on another software. So I just put like something there. So um, the first one is a very interesting project. It's called uh, Ilua. So Lua itself is written in C, and then Lua runs on the top of that, and it runs on bare metal. So there is no operator system between that and this uh, little thing. Um, this uh, is a fork of the ESP8266 microcontroller. It's the Node MCU, and it uses Lua, and it costs four dollars and has a Wi-Fi. It's amazing. It's very cheap for what it gets you. Um, Ilua has also been used on uh, NASA. They have test rockets for future mission to Mars, and they are using Ilua to get uh, velocity data when the disk enters on, on Earth. So it, it is pretty nice. Um, well, I believe I don't need to introduce World of Warcraft. So um, it uses Lua as a scripting language, which is, <laughs> I think, the most common and use of Lua and the initial purpose of Lua. So World of Warcraft is programmed in C++, so the biggest part of the code base is C++, and then it embeds Lua as a library, and then you can use Lua to write add-ons and interface things without needing to recompile the whole thing, which is pretty nice. And on a different way of using Lua, which is my favorite one, uh, it's using it as a general purpose language. So Adobe Lightroom is a very popular uh, image edition software, and the main language of development of it is Lua. So, uh, so, so the program is written in Lua, and when it needs very specific things, uh, so for example, very tough algorithms for image processing, then it calls C++. So I, I think this is a very pleasant way of coding, in fact. So how to get Lua? Um, 
Well, it's pretty easy. You go on Lua.org and click on download. But <laughs> there are other ways to do that. Um, most operating systems, um, you'll have it on the packet manager, so we can just do it to get install Lua or pre-install Lua. And I advise very much to get Lua Rocks. So Lua Rocks is the packet manager for Lua, so it's like Ruby Gems or NPM for, for the other languages. Um, for Mac, it comes with Lua. When you install Lua, it installs both of them. For other systems, you need to get it separately. So you either go to luarocks.org and click install and follow the instructions, or yeah, go through apt-get or whatever packet manager you have. So let's start with some key concepts of the language. Uh, one very particular thing of Lua is that it has one single data structure that is called tables. This may sound a little restrictive, having only one data structure, but it's not. It's actually very liberating because this structure is more flexible than the structures on some other languages. So we can do everything with it. So a ta you can uh, use a table as an array, so a dictionary is a table, an object is a table, list, queue, and even a model, which is how we call a package or library in the Lua community, is also a table. Uh, anything can be a key except nil and not a value, so you can put tables as keys and values and functions on the keys. You can do very weird stuff with that, and uh, you can do amazing data structures and do lots of different things. Behind the scenes, in terms of language implementation, it is implemented as a hybrid structure. There is port a uh, hash table and port array. So what happens is that when you use the table as an array, meaning only integer keys, uh, starting on one, um, with no holes in between, Lua deals it as an array. So without uh, keys overhead, it performs as an array, so it is the equivalent of a C array. And then for everything else, it will use the hash part. Which is, so this implementation is very efficient and is an original idea of the Lua uh, art architecture. So this is, this is a nice thing. Um, tables are always pass at reference. So if a function returns a table, there are no hidden copies uh, happening on the background. So it is uh, very efficient. There is a length operator. This does sometimes does not do what we expect because measures the array part. So if you're using uh, a table to store many different things, this might not give a good number because it will count only the array part of the table. And you can iterate through the table with the function pairs, which will iterate through everything that's inside it, or through uh, i pairs. That, uh, so this is for integer. So we'll iterate through the array part, and so this is more efficient than that, but this is only for a specific case. So um, some examples. Uh, so you can create a, a table using curlies, and you can iterate for it using a normal numeric fork to the size of the table. But you can also do that, so you can uh, index with square back brackets, and you can iterate through it using the iPairs iterator. Lua also has a syntactic sugar for string keys. So here, uh, for example, we have our little uh, point object, so we could index to the x and y fields like this, or we could use this uh, thing on the third uh, print line, and so they are exactly the same thing, but this looks a lot cleaner. So this will help us a lot when we try to do object orientation or just using tables as a model and things like that. So uh, like I said before, you can do very, very interesting stuff with tables and very different structures. So you can use tables, for example, for sets and multi-sets, and then it works really nicely. Um, I'm going to show you now how to use a table as a module. 
So um, this is our little library. And uh, it begins with a table, and then we return this table in the end. And that's it. That's how we make a model. So things that we want to be public are indexed to the table. So a method is just a function indexed to our model. So this will be carried out here. Things that we want to be private are just defined locally. So this stays in the model. And then we can use a model like that. So when we require a um, cipher, so this will be the, the file name, in fact, without the .lua. It will assign this table to our variable, and then we can use it. So this is like in another file. Well, one of the very powerful things about Lua, though, is meta tables. These things here, they're amazing. So what are they? So meta tables are tables, and you use them to modify the behaviors of other tables. So you can use that to make things like operator overload between tables. Uh, so do things like if I add a table to a table, how do I want it to function? You can override with built-in functions such as to string. You can treat a missing index on a table, so you can give an error. Normally, if you index a table and it doesn't, the field is not there, it just gives you nil. But if you want to do something different, you can just use meta tables with the index method. And uh, well, you can intercept new field creation. Uh, you can also call table as a function. So there is a meta method called call. So we have plenty of meta methods. All of them, most, most of them need to be a function, except for index and new index, which can be other tables. So let's see how that um, works in, in practice. So suppose you want to implement complex numbers in Lua. So what is a complex, complex number? It is a number that has a real part and an imaginary part. So let's check this, um, new, uh, this new function to create our complex number. So firstly, um, it creates our little object with uh, the, f the fields real and m for imaginary. Oh, this is a, um, another small idiom you see a lot in Lua. So to set default values, you can use uh, or. So if or or i are not passed, it will evaluate to nil. So this, uh, f the first step here will fail, and it will assign zero to the thing. So this is how I do default values. Um, so going on. So it creates our object. And then it assigns a table we just created, we call MT, to this object as uh, it sets this table as a meta table to this object. And then we return our new object with this meta table. So an easy way to verify if our object is a complex number is to see if they are using this meta table we just assigned. And then we can do the magic. So we can have functions for all operations we want. So we can make an add function that will verify um, things that need to be, ver be verified. So if the first number is complex, do one thing. If not, do one other thing. I'll return everything that needs to be returned. And um, you can do some pretty printing. And then you, uh, you use that as meta methods in the meta table. And then you can do things like this. So we can just create a new complex number that has uh, the two as the real part and three in the imaginary part using the new function. You can uh, add it with a normal Lua number. And then we'll do our pretty printing, seven plus three i, and it works. Function new visible outside of this? Oh, I, yeah, I did not really structure this as a model, just supposing this is in the same file. Yeah, I did not do like the last slide. But yeah, if you wanted, I could have created a new table over here called complex. Uh, 
th and this new would be indexed to complex, and then here we will require, etc. So let's see how we can do objects. So I, we have seen tables being used as objects before, but now I'm going to get a little more, uh, uh, a little deeper into it. So um, in most of programming languages, um, object methods, uh, when you call a method, it will pass the object itself as the first parameter uh, of the of the function call of the method call, and then this will be done implicitly, and then it will be called this or self or whatever. In Lua, this is explicit, so you put it as first argument. You can call it whatever you want, and then you have this object. However, you can um, oops. However, you can use the colon operator, which is a syntax sugar, which will assume that the first parameter, uh, that the first argument is the object itself and call it itself. So we can do things like this. Uh, you can use the table and the function like that, and then we'll pass the table itself as uh, an argument. So you have an object and a method. If you want to make another table, uh, it will work as well. So suppose we have here, uh, so we have a square. Here we have a different square. As long as it also has x, y, and side fields, and it will operate just like the first object. So instead of using the, the column operator, you can use a normal dot and pass the second square here, and then it will understand that was the argument in itself. But this is a little crappy, right? It looks weird. So we can do better than that. We can make a class. So um, this is a square class. Uh, it is capital just for convention. Um, so let's take a look at the new, uh, at the new function. Ah. So um, what does it do? First, it creates a new object with, so uh, this is a new table, with the x, y, and side fields. And then this is where the magic happens. This is what makes it possible to do object orientation in Lua. So what it does is, so firstly, let's remember that the first argument is the object itself. So self is this whole square thing here. Um, and then it index, uh, it uses the index meta methods and this whole thing here as the index meta method. So in practice, what it does is that when you try to access this object O, if you find, um, if you use an index that is not there, X, Y, or side, it will look it up on the meta table because of the index meta method. So in practice, what it does is that um, this object inherits all the methods of square. And you can do amazing things with that. You can do so inheritance, multiple in inheritance. You can do pretty tricks to solve very complex stuff. It is, it is very nice. Yes, yes. And then by the end, we have this. So we can use our square. Um, so this is a normal module that operates as a class. So then you can require our square, use, um, and then we'll assign this table to a local variable. And then you can use it to create as many squares as you want and use the methods as you want. Um, going further, so uh, we are coming to the end of my talk, but before that, I'm going to give you some, some links and stuff in case you want to take a deeper look. So in terms of resources, uh, the programming Lua book is a must read. 
not because it's something that you need to read to learn Lua, no, you don't need that, but it is an amazing book. It's an excellent book, and I personally recommend it for being amazing, for learning things about programming and how to make a programming language and how things work. It is a very excellent book. Uh, Lua Programming Gems has some use cases and code snippets for some situations. It's also very interesting. In terms of tutorials, you find, uh, so there's this Lua style guide at the luausers.org uh, slash wiki. This wiki is amazing. I use it f a lot, like, I wouldn't say every day, but like, a lot. Um, Lua Missions is a, pro is a little project on GitHub that is very nice. So it has lots of steps, and by the end of each uh, mission, you learn a little thing, and by the end of the whole thing, you sh should be expected to know Lua. Um, code Combat. Um, this is something that is particularly amazing. So you won't find Lua in things like Code Academy, for example, but you'll find it here. Cold Combat um, is an online RPG game where you control your character programming. So you can pick different languages, and Lua is one of the options. This thing also has been translated to pretty much any natural language I know. So this is an excellent uh, tool for educational purpose. So you can have things in your native language, teaching, um, so there's the whole gaming thing, and the whole interaction it will be doing whatever, Portuguese, um, Russian, um, Spanish, anything. And, uh, and you can control the character and play. I think it's multiplayer, which is even more awesome. Uh, in terms of community, Lua has the Lua mailing list. Um, they are very approachable, so if you want to ask something, if you want to share things, you just do it. You don't really have to be afraid. We are really nice people. So some cool things. I have already told you about um, a Lua and Node MCU. It's worth taking a look. Um, for math and scientific computing, there are many options. Lua is used a lot for that. But uh, this one here needs a special attention, which is Torch. So Torch is a framework for machine learning, and it's, um, it's kind of popular, and it's very good. So if you need to do some machine learning, it's worth taking a look at that. Um, in terms of game development, well, there's just so many stuff that I couldn't even know what to put here, but I just brought you some stuff. So there is um, Love2D, which is very, very easy to use for doing simple 2D games. Uh, there is Default Engine, which is the one that King uses, so it is worth, it's worth taking a look as well, and there are many others. Um, for web development, uh, Lua is used a lot on NGINX, so there is a distribution of NGINX called OpenRest, which is just uh, NGINX with a bundle of libraries, including the Lua library. S and it's very used for things like load balancing and things like that, but it can also be used for just normal web development. So Lapis is a very flexible uh, framework using Lua that runs on the top of OpenRST. I would say it's like Flask of Lua. Um, there is Loveit, which is a port of Node.js to Lua that claims to be two to four times faster and save up to 20 times memory. So if you need performance and interesting things and asynchronous web development, it's worth taking a look. My, my bad thing with it is that the documentation is not that good, but if you already know Node.js and things like that, it is very easy to get going. And then there is Sailor, which is my thing. So Sailor is an MVC web framework in Lua that runs on the top of OpenRSC, but also on the top of Apache and uh, pure Lua web servers such as Chavanti. Um, and, oh, in case you're wondering about the links and everything, I will share the slides on Twitter. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see the, I'll, I'll give you the slides, the PDF, and it has all the, the links over there. So you don't need to be very worried about copying everything right now. 
Um, another thing is uh, moonshine. So moonshine uh, is a, is a s it should be maybe in a different category. So uh, moonshine is a translator from Lua to JavaScript. So you can do Lua on the browser on the client side for web development. So for example, I use it on, on Sailor. So on well, Sailor, for example, you can use Lua for both the back end and the front end. And this is done because of things like Moonshine. There is another one called Starlight that I used too, but it's not very well documented. It's a new thing, so maybe not a good thing to put in there right now, but it should be worth taking a look later. Um, other things there, so we have, there is an IDE. I don't particularly use that. I just use text editor, but in case you want one, there is one. Um, for testing, uh, Busted is a very popular library for unit testing. I use that a lot as well. Packet management, I have already told uh, about Lua Rocks. It is strictly necessary. <laughs> Miscellaneous stuff, uh, Moonscript. Moonscript is a language that compiles to Lua like CoffeeScript compiles to JavaScript. It's interesting. Um, awesome Lua, in case you want to know even more, there is this GitHub uh, account here, this GitHub uh, project, which is just a very huge version of my last slides. So it has lots of resources for different categories of lots of cool stuff and Lua that you can use for doing your things. Um, so that's it. I've come to the end of my talk. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask me now or on Twitter. Thank you. Yes. Quick question. You didn't mention the most important thing. What does Lua mean in Portuguese? Oh, I did. It's uh, okay. it's moon. I didn't hear that. Okay. Can I have one more, please? Sure. You will have to speak slower, please. All right. That's the Lua of bitwise operations. Um, I saw that so it's used for actually following. So Lua. So there's there's different implementations of Lua. So there is vanilla Lua, which is the standard uh, Pontif the standard Lua created in the Pontiff Catholic University. But like I said before, there is the just-in-time implementation of Lua, and this just-in-time implementation has bitwise operators. Or there are external libraries and external implementations that will do that. Other questions? Yes. Uh, in your opinion, how does Lua compare to Python and JavaScript for a beginner language for introduction? Oh, yes, that, that, that is an interesting topic because yesterday I gave a talk about teaching JavaScript. So, well, it really depends on the case. So, in my case, yesterday was a very short workshop, two hours. So, honestly, in that case, the only thing that will fit in two hours for given the basic concepts, in my opinion, is JavaScript. But for everything else, if I have a little more time to spend with the students, then I would use Lua. Because the syntax is, is, is very friendly for non-programmers. It was conceived with this purpose. It is very readable. You can do lots of things with that. And it has a niche in game development with, for beginners. It looks fun. So um, I don't do lots of game development, honestly, but that was my first experience with programming. It was just amazing. So yeah, I, 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 would, I would prefer Lua for, for teaching uh, when I have more time. And if I don't have a lot of time, if it needs to be something fast, I would, I would use JavaScript. Uh, I think we're done. We don't have any more time for questions, but I'll be around. So if you want to ask me anything, you can find me on the corridors, or you can follow me on Twitter and talk to me later. Thank you.